they're not. Hi, this is the Retro Sofa. I'm Bill, and I'm a gamer, and so are you. A gamer. You might or might not be Bill. Anyway, some retro games are better, and all cats are beautiful. Let's do this. As long as there have been at least two video games, there have been good games and bad games. And while new types of games have developed in that time that might not be particularly to your tastes or to mine, that doesn't mean gaming as a whole has got worse. It just means that it's attracting different demographics, and that's fine and good. Let me give you an example. The argument you hear so often against so-called modern gaming is that it's full of microtransactions. Well, what games are you playing? Candy Crush. We didn't even have Candy Crush in the 80s and 90s. Mobile games are a new type of thing and a new type of experience, and people expect mobile games to be small and bite-sized, and to pay small and bite-sized amounts of money for them. So if you want to monetize that, it's got to be small payments. Square Enix first released Final Fantasy III for Android in 2012 for 13 euros, and if you want to buy it now, it's 18 euros if you want it in 3D, and 20 euros if you want it in 2D. Fans all over just grab their pitchforks. People don't expect to pay more than 10 euros for a mobile game. They expect to pay a buck for Cut the Rope. Now Cut the Rope has ads, or it costs 10 euros a month. See what we did, you with your pitchforks. Because people were quite willing to pay 20 euros for a game on Steam, but not pay 20 euros for exactly the same game on their phones, mobile gaming had to innovate. And innovation in capitalism, I promise this isn't another huge anti-capitalist rant means micropayments, and ads, and making the games chemically addictive, and making it much easier to pay, and much harder not to pay, and making it pay to win, and OK, maybe I can have a little anti-capitalism as a treat. Anyway, if you hate microtransactions, your problem isn't modern gaming, your problem is capitalism, welcome, comrade. I said pay to compete, which brings us to multiplayer games. The only one I play regularly is Magic Arena, and I checked, and I haven't given them any money for exactly a year. I got to Mythic Rank and Constructed 2 just last week, then immediately lost it again, because I don't like good cards, I like Doom Foothold, and that's my problem. Nobody else's. I need the jank, not the rank. But outside of grinding for a couple of hours a day, Magic Arena is totally pay to win. There are plenty of other games that aren't, but are still monetized through microtransactions or through subscriptions. You've got your Fortnite, your TF Dudes, your Call of Dudes, your Duta, your World of War Dudes, and Trombone Champ. That's kind of got microtransactions, but in the form of beers you buy for your friends who come over to play Trombone Champ, which is kind of fine. It's the old school way of doing it. Just like mobile, these games didn't exist when gaming was young, and they've had to monetize around the need to offer an ongoing service. Time was, you bought Quake 3 Arena and people ran their own servers, and it was a bit messy, but we had a good time. But to make the games more accessible, companies want to host their own servers, and internet and electricity and big metal boxes cost a lot of money. Online games have an ongoing expense for the seller, so it needs to be an ongoing expense for the buyer in some fashion. That could be pay to win, but usually it's cosmetics or subscriptions, and you know it kind of makes sense. Even Nintendo charges for their online service now. As gaming's exploded into the mainstream, companies have had to provide a more polished and accessible service, so they have to charge for it. So does that mean retro games are just better because they came from a time when gaming was least popular, so companies didn't have to worry about that? A bit gatekeepy, isn't it? Gate's open! Come the heck on in! Have a lovely time, as far as I'm concerned. My mother-in-law's a gamer. She plays the aforementioned Candy Crush Saga. Actually, my mum's a gamer because she plays Wordle and a decent game of Scrabble. Hi, Mum. I'll get you next time. Games are for everyone, and everyone who games is a gamer, so instead of using gamers brackets derogatory to describe the seedier parts of a particular subculture, maybe we should pick a term that doesn't discourage normal people from just having some fun. Oh, I can't play because I couldn't possibly be a gamer. No, it's not true. It's for you. Come and play. Buy a secondhand Wii, and let's go bowling, and we can be gamers together. There's nothing wrong with that, and I don't like the idea of racists and misogynists getting to keep a monopoly on a term for themselves that should apply to everyone. You game, you're a gamer. Enjoy your gaming. It's as much for you as it is for me or for anyone else. Every time you call someone a gamer like it's a bad thing, you're perpetuating the same gatekeeping that these types of people like to hold on to like a comfort blanket. If your concern is updates, then yeah, okay. That is a difference with modern games. Once upon a time, you'd buy your video game and take it home and slot it in and have a great time and that would be the end of it. Now, when you put your game in, you have to wait ages for it to download updates. On this, you do kind of have a point, but that's because we're in a weird in-between stage between retail and digital gaming. Steam's pretty much nailed digital distribution on the PC and you can't buy physical PC games anymore usually. The release of the PS5 Digital Edition console is pushing the console space more in this direction too, and Nintendo has all of their Switch games to be fully downloadable from the eShop, and they were always slow to adopt online services. But cartridges and discs are going away, and when all games are digital, you will always get the latest version, so if you're buying a slightly older game, it'll come with all the latest patches already built in, just like Steam. There are a lot of issues with this in terms of game preservation and the concept of ownership. 
Spec Ops The Line has been pulled from Steam recently because the developer would have had to continue to license music in the game. Some developers get around this by just removing the music in question. Neither solution is ideal. It means the artwork as originally created is either incomplete or not available at all. Plus, there have been some instances of digital stores just taking away stuff consumers paid for so they can no longer access it, like when Sony's agreement with Discover came to an end. I hope by the time physical media is phased out entirely, will have solved these problems and digital storefronts will be analogous to physical shops, where if you buy something, it's yours forever and you can resell it or lend it out or whatever you want, and there's no possibility of it being taken away from you. We're not there yet though, and I'm not holding my breath. These are the sorts of things that need governments to step in, because if you leave big companies to get on with whatever they want, they'd far rather sell you a limited license to access a thing rather than just sell you the thing, or they might just straight up rent it to you. But for the here and now, I don't think updates are really all that bad. They're annoying at the time, but for those of us lucky enough to have a reasonable internet connection, it's not so big a deal. It's a tough balancing act for developers, because while we can say we want fewer updates, which updates do you want to lose? Buddy the dog is my very best friend. Do you know why? Why? Because with him, anything is pausable. Way! Just give the word and I will kill the clown. We would be praised as heroes. When I was playing Baldur's Gate 3, I was constantly reading patch notes in full to see if they'd fixed little bugs that annoyed me personally, or made improvements I wanted to see in the game. Then I was annoyed if I didn't know an update was coming and I had to sit and wait for it. With older games, you get none of that. No waiting, but also no bug fixes or patches or new features. What's better? I don't know. It depends on the game, I guess. Day Zero updates are obviously a special kind of annoying, but that's largely down to publishers not giving games long enough to cook. And at least there's a way for the developers to take a little longer to give you the experience they wanted you to have on day one. And if you're telling me your problem with modern gaming is publishers mistreating their developers with unreasonable deadlines, then I'm totally with you on that point. So how about nostalgia? In my last video, I talked about how Europe didn't get any JRPGs, and therefore I don't have any nostalgia for JRPGs. I enjoy JRPGs from that era, but not any more than I enjoy JRPGs now. Honestly, I found Earthbound kind of hard to get into. I don't have the same nostalgia goggles for it that other people have. So what does retro mean to you? I've done a video discussing that as well, and retro gaming is tied inextricably to nostalgia. A reasonable definition of a retro game is a game you played in your formative years. If we're honest, that's what most people mean. So what about a retro game you didn't play? If you never played Baldur's Gate 1, is it better than Baldur's Gate 3? Of course not. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the best games ever made and I completed it multiple times. I don't think I'm past like, the second town in Baldur's Gate 1 and honestly I've got no idea what I'm doing. But if you played it back when it was new, then I can imagine you have an awful lot of love and affection for it. I prefer Super Mario Bros. 3 on the NES to Super Mario Bros. Wonder and I prefer Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles on the NES to Shredder's Revenge. Yeah, really. So if you come to this video with a particular game or set of games in mind that you played when you were a kid, then I've got news for you. Those are the best games in the world. Last year, I replayed Mario 3 on original hardware, and the thing about Mario 3 on original hardware is that it's a big game with no saves. I had to leave the NES on. I went to work with the NES still sitting at home, powered on with a little red light on the front, and I was thinking about it all day, about how I was going to turn the TV on and continue right where I left off. And that gave me this really powerful memory from when I used to go to school and do just the same thing. Plus, we had fish fingers for lunch that day. Or oh, fish stäbchen. Adults eat them in Germany, which is correct. They're good. Fish sticks if you're American. That feeling of being a kid and having a game waiting for you, filling your mind every waking minute, obsessing over the experience, is so unique and powerful that no game released since you became a functioning adult is ever going to top it. Ever. And that could be why a lot of people think retro games are better, is because they're thinking of very specific retro games. But if you didn't play Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles on the NES when you were a kid, go play it now. I'll wait. Actually, I've got my Switch right here, and I'm going to play some Shantae and the Seven Sirens while you play Turtles. The reason Shantae is awesome, one of many, is because it's a new game that's part of a genre that started in the mid-80s, the Metroidvania. Silly name. It basically just describes an action game with exploration and having to find new abilities to progress to different areas, rather than progression being linear through numbered levels. There were a few of these back in the day, but the genre has exploded in popularity since Cave Story ushered in a wave of incredible indie Metroidvanias. You don't think retro games are better because of those styles of gameplay, because those styles of gameplay never went away. In fact, have we lost any? Video games pretty much from the start included sports games, platform games, puzzle games, text adventures, shooters, and racing games, and beat-em-ups. And all of those genres have seen titles released this year. There are even fairly recent examples of maze games and block-breaker games. We haven't lost anything. 
really. We've only added simulations and first-person shooters, various mobile games and various genres built around online multiplayer that have become technically possible since the advent of video games. But if there's a genre you liked back in the day, you can find a recent game for it. People used to talk about the death of 2D gaming, but I'm not convinced it ever went away. When the PlayStation was new, we were all talking about how all games were 3D now, but the PlayStation had 79 2D platforms. Granted, the SNES had 277, but while new 3D action games ate into some of that space in the mid to late 90s, the 2D platformer never went away. Not really. And if you're comparing retro to modern, the Xbox One has 775 2D platformers. Better get started. The point is that, although the industry has a lot of problems right now, in terms of the quantity, quality and variety of games available, there's never been a better time to be a gamer. I'm playing the big single-player adventures I've always played, from A Link to the Past to Cyberpunk 2077, and I'm not being pressured into microtransactions or useless DLC or anything else. And Cyberpunk 2077 was way cheaper than A Link to the Past, and way longer. And if I do feel the need to play a new 2D Zelda-style game, there's always Tunic from 2022. I haven't tried it yet. I don't think I'll like it as much as A Link to the Past. But if you didn't play A Link to the Past in the 90s, there's every possibility that you would prefer to play Tunic, and that's fine. And I might disagree. In fact, the five best games ever made, in no particular order, are as follows. The Legends of Zelda A Link to the Past, Super Mario World, Baldur's Gate 3, Cyberpunk 2077, and Tetris. Some retro, some not. Doesn't matter. Games is games is games. There have always been good games, and there have always been bad games, and the longer there have been games, the more games we've had available to play, whether new or old. I had a friend who told me that he couldn't get into retro games because of how terrible they looked. That's a deep cut, my friend. Except it isn't, because that's just his opinion. And if he's just a magpie with thumbs enjoying all the shinies, then that's his deal. He's happy. You don't have to like retro games. There's a bit of a weird channel for you to choose to watch. But that's fine. Everyone's welcome. But if you're put off by 2D sprites and chunky pixels with fewer colours, then maybe it's not for you, and that's okay. There's no reason to force yourself to like something just because you think you ought to. Conversely, if you have an objection to modern gaming, then you can just stick to retro and there's nothing wrong with that either. You don't have to spend your time complaining about something that doesn't appeal to you, when you could just spend your time enjoying something that does. Do what you want with your free time, as long as you have a good time. And thank you for using some of it to join me on the retro sofa.